Jesus Christ. Good morning, beloved brothers in Christ. Father Dave's word just now about surprises of the Holy Spirit really resonated with me. And I have the same sense. The Holy Spirit wants to surprise us this week. So I want to just begin with a prayer, just inviting the Holy Spirit to come and do whatever he wants. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We invite you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you in this place. Spirit of God, there is infinitely more to you than we have yet thought or imagined. We welcome you into our hearts and into our minds. And we stand ready for your surprises, Holy Spirit. Blow like a fresh wind through us and through this place. Breathe on us. Blow away from us all that is earthbound and man-centered so that we would be ready to move with you, Holy Spirit. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was thinking this morning as I was praying about this talk, th about the fact that many people think that the Catholic charismatic renewal, which began 51 years ago, is passe. It's had its day. If you look around, especially North America and Europe, you, you know, it's waning. Numbers are declining. Prayer groups are shrinking, graying, aging. Seems to be something that's over and done. Move on to something else. And I want to say to you, beloved brothers in Christ, that from what I can see, what I've witnessed all over the world, God isn't done yet. God is not done yet. God is only beginning. What he had in mind when he poured out his Holy Spirit in a whole fresh new way, beginning with college students at Duquesne, close to this place 51 years ago. I was in Poland this past weekend. I met many young people, spirit-filled, incredibly impressive in the way that they were moving with, with God. And one of them was a young couple. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. At age 22, they founded a community. This community is, is growing and it's evangelizing. And two years ago, when Pope Francis was in Poland for World Youth Day, they prepared a team of 111 people to evangelize the youth who would be there. And this team went out on the streets and they just walked up to everybody and asked, do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And they prayed over 8,000 young people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And in many cases, when they prayed over people, oil started dripping off their hands. A supernatural sign. God is truly moving in new ways in this time. And I really believe, as, as I, I look back over the last 51 years, and I, I've been praying and asking the Lord, why are you doing what you are doing? Help, help me to understand your purposes. Help me to read the signs of the times and in, interpret them in the light of the gospel. I think the, the main purpose is clear. Through the last four popes, the Lord has been calling the church to a new evangelization to go out once again into the highways and the byways and to bring home the lost and the broken and to gain back for the Lord the world that had wandered away from him and that he died and paid the price of his most precious blood to redeem. The Lord is sending us out once more into this new evangelization. And yet, how have we been doing in this new evangelization in the Western world? Not so great so far. Our, our church is packed with people coming to 
because they want to know Jesus and coming to be baptized and, and formed in him and, and grow? Of course not. Most parts of this country, it's going in the other direction. Why is that happening? Because I think we haven't yet picked up on what the Lord is doing. <laughs> we haven't yet recognized that what he did beginning in 1967 was to once again equip his bride, the body of Christ, with the full supernatural power of heaven that Jesus, her Lord, gave her from the beginning to carry out her evangelizing mission. He never intended it to be carried out by human resources only. If you look at how Jesus first commissioned the 12 to begin to share in his mission, he sent them out on a practice mission. He said, go, preach the kingdom of God. But that's not all he said, right? He didn't say, you know, give people a, a, an eloquent message, a, a very convincing, catechetical, apologetic, doctrinal treatise. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm in favor of that. That's, that's not what Jesus said. He said, go preach the kingdom, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, preach it in words, and in supernatural signs and wonders, supernatural deeds by which I will confirm the truth of the words. He said that to the twelve. We sometimes think, well, yeah, but they, you know, they were, of course, special, unique, 12 apostles, the foundation stones of the church. Yes, they were, but actually, if you turn the page from Luke 9, where he sends out the 12, to Luke 10, where he sends out a bigger group of 70, representing all his disciples, it gives them the same commission. Go, preach the kingdom of God, heal the sick, preach it in words, and in deeds that corroborate the truth of the words, the kingdom is here. Christ is alive. God loves you, and he has sent his son to redeem you and to free you from everything that keeps you from the fullness of life that he intended for you. And then when Jesus ascended into heaven, he promised the supernatural power for them to actually carry out that commission, the Holy Spirit. It never says anywhere in the New Testament, nor does it say anywhere in the teachings of the church that our Lord has changed his missionary instructions. <laughs> they remain the same today, and yet we have neglected them for such a long time that the Lord has had to do something extraordinary in our time. And he did it even before the popes began talking about a new evangelization. Beginning in 1967, and now what the Lord is doing once again in our time today, 2018, is actually a return to normal. <laughs> Healings, miracles, prophecies, words of knowledge, faith that moves mountains, discernment of spirits, casting out spirits, supernaturally reconciling enemies, bringing peace where there was no peace, all of that moving in the power of the Holy Spirit for the proclamation of the gospel is a return to normal. Because walking in the supernatural, as we see from the whole New Testament, is the normal Christian life. And so thank God for what he's doing today. I'll just give you a couple of examples of, of how the Lord is he's just pulling out all the stops today. At a parish near me, Michigan, they held an Alpha course. Probably most of you are familiar with the Alpha course. It's basic evangelization. It's not catechesis. It's pre-catechesis. It's for people who are way far away from God and the church to help answer their questions and proclaim the gospel to them. And so they were going through this, and there was a young girl attending named Kate. And she came to one of the Alpha sessions just having received a terrible diagnosis. Well, actually, not a diagnosis, but basically just a report from her doctor, her whole body was covered with hives and it, what looked like bug bites. 
her doctor and sent her to the allergist who told her, you have some anaphylactic reaction to some unknown allergen. We can't figure out what it is because there's no single spot on your skin that's healthy that we can even use for testing. If you come in contact with this allergen again, which we, we don't know what it is, your throat could close in five minutes and you could die. So imagine what the burden lying on this girl as she comes to the alpha session that night. And at the end of the, she, you know, she's paying attention, but at the end she's, she's in tears because she's so desperate. And the people around her said, let's pray over her. And her parish priest, Father Mark Rutherford, led a group of people praying over her. And these people were just ordinary folks. They weren't charismatic renewal folks. They weren't experienced in prayer ministry. But they laid hands on this young girl, and they, they just prayed for her, for the Lord to heal her. And then she went home with her mom and her sister. And later on, as she was changing into pajamas, they heard her begin to scream. They ran into her room. She's looking at her arms. They're totally clear. No more scabs. <laughs> no more... Glory to God. <laughs> and then her sister says, wow, when, when we were praying over you, I was praying over your legs, and your legs felt really hot. So she lifted up her pant leg, her legs too, totally clear. And then her father came in, and the entire family were so in awe, they spent the entire night praising and thanking and worshiping God. <laughs> the power of God came into that family that night. They can't be the same after that. And here's another story. Uh, a friend of mine, Patrick Rice, he ha he's founded Encounter Ministries. If you're not familiar with that yet, I encourage you to look it up. He was a youth minister, and he organized Night Fever with his youth group. You might have heard of Night Fever. Uh, it's a beautiful concept. It's, it's where you hold Eucharistic adoration in a church that's in a city area, and then the kids go out into the streets, and they invite people in off the street. Say, come on in. You can just you can light a candle. You could spend a few minutes with the Lord. You're, you're most welcome. So they held this, and the young people went out on the street, and they, they found a guy in a wheelchair. And they gave him a rosary, and they said, come on into the church for night fever. And so they were very happy when he came. And Patrick saw this guy there in a wheelchair, introduced himself, and said, is there anything you'd like us to pray for for you? He said, well, I, I, I'm hungry, <laughs> I need food, and I need money. Patrick looked at him and just popped out of his mouth, how would you like to walk? <laughs> and then he's thinking, why did I say that? <laughs> but he knew the Lord was doing something, so he, he, said, he said to this guy named Willie, he said, um, do you think Jesus could heal you? I don't know. How about if you just close your eyes for a moment and ask Jesus, do you want to heal me? So he did that. Patrick said, are you getting anything? Nope, nothing. And then Patrick said, Willie, is there anybody you need to forgive in your life? He began to cry. He said, there's so many people I need to forgive. And he talked about how his wife had left him and his seven children had left him and there were people who had abused him. It was like his heart was cracking open. And Patrick began to walk him through prayers of forgiveness, forgiving any, every one of the people who had offended him. And then he said, now ask the Lord again, do you want to heal me? He closed his eyes. And he said, yes, he said yes, he said yes, he wants to heal me. <laughs> so Patrick said, all right, let's begin to pray. Where should we begin? And, the, and, and Willie said, well, pray for my hands, I got arthritis. He also explained that he was in the wheelchair because he had been shot. His spine had been damaged. He hadn't been able to walk in seven years. And on top of all that, he had prostate cancer. <laughs> okay, let's pray for his arthritis. Patrick got an image in his mind of Willie doing ballroom dancing. He thought, nah, I don't think so. He doesn't look like a ballroom dancing type. <laughs> but he just decided to move with it, taking a risk in the spirit. So he said, Willie, do you, do you by any chance like to dance? He said, oh yeah, my wife and I used to love to go ballroom dancing. <laughs> so Patrick said to one of the young girls who was there, he said, why don't you take his hands, just swing them back and forth as if he's dancing. So she did that in his wheelchair. His pain started to leave. 
Then they prayed over his back. He had severe pain in his back. He felt pain drain out of his back. He felt like the Lord was moving, and without anybody asking, he just kind of pulled himself up from his wheelchair, and he, he just began to hug all of the young people around who were watching this whole thing unfold. And then Patrick said to him, up there on the altar, that, that white host, that's Jesus, and you should go thank him for what he's doing. And the next thing you know, Patrick is walking to the altar, supported by two kids in the youth group. He's walking on his own to the altar, and everybody in the room starts seeing what's happening and just praising and glorifying God. That was seven years ago. Willie does not need a wheelchair to this day. He went to the doctor who said he's cancer-free, can't figure out why his cancer is in remission. Willie got a job, and one of his kids has visited him. His whole life is transformed. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> So, beloved brothers, these are the kinds of things the Lord is doing today. It's awesome what he's doing today. Now, my talk is called Authority and Humility. By the way, I had no idea what Bishop Montfortin was going to talk about. <laughs> That's when you know the Holy Spirit's in charge. <laughs> my, what I'm going to say is, fits very well with what he said, even though it um, doesn't overlap. I'm, I'm sure the Holy Spirit planned it. Authority and humility, because I believe if we want to be walking in the supernatural, and the Lord wants every one of you to be walking in the supernatural, whether you're a seminarian, or you've been a priest for 20 years or 50 years, the Lord has more for you. He's not finished with you. And the young people who are opening themselves to the Holy Spirit today, they need you. They need your wisdom. They need your pastoring. They need you to be a model. The Lord wants you to be walking in the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? Authority and humility. We think of the most unusual person who ever lived, Jesus of Nazareth. One time it says in the Gospel of John that the chief priest sent some officers to arrest him, and they came back without him. And the, and the chief priest said, why didn't you arrest him? They said, no man ever spoke this way. They were spellbound by him. There was something totally unique about him. On the one hand, he had a breathtaking sense of his own exalted dignity. And so he said things like, you have heard it said, and then he would give the law of Moses, authored by God, and then he'd say, but I say to you, putting himself on a par with the divine lawgiver. He demanded absolute loyalty. He said things like, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Shocking to say in that cultural context. He hinted that he was greater than Solomon, that he was greater than David, greater than Jacob, greater than Abraham greater than the temple. He said, I and the Father are one. This incredible sense of authority and dignity. And yet, on the other hand, a stunning humility and meekness. Born in a stable, in a place for animals. Spent most of his life, life as a blue collar worker, doing manual labor. He hung out with the nobodies, the unimportant, the non-religious, the disreputable people, the people of no account. He said things like, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Put himself on a par with a child. He said, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing for whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. He said, take my yoke on you and learn from me because I'm meek and humble of heart. What's the secret of that awesome authority 
united with that profound humility. It's that Jesus was utterly secure in his identity as the beloved son. At his baptism, an act of total humility, identifying with sinners, undergoing the baptism of repentance for sin, which he didn't need, saying yes to the Father's plan that he would be counted among sinners, he came up from those waters and he heard the Father's voice, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Everything he did from that moment on was rooted in the profound human security of his father's love. Then the Holy Spirit propelled him into the desert. Satan tempted him. And do you remember the very first words that Satan spoke to him? What were the very first words the evil one said? If you are the son of God, immediately sowing doubt, immediately trying to undermine that truth spoken by the father trying to get Jesus to doubt his identity as the beloved son of God because if he could do that, then he could get Jesus to try to shore up his identity by doing spectacular works, like turning stones into bread, jumping off the parapet of the temple and getting caught up by angels. And if Satan had done that, succeeded in getting Jesus to do that, then Jesus would have been a Messiah other than that willed by the Father. And his whole mission would have been derailed and Satan would win. Satan tried to undermine his identity so he could derail his destiny. And Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, resisted those lies. And he stood in the truth of who he was as the Father's beloved son. Jesus didn't need his ego to be propped up or stroked or supported or approved by any human being. He was never defensive. He had nothing to defend. Neither flattery nor insult could move him at all. Nothing could budge him from his position standing in who he was in the eyes of the Father. Sometimes his adversaries would lay on the flattery thick. And they would say things like, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Now tell us whether we should pay taxes to Caesar or not. Trying to trip him up, right? Trying to make make that effusive praise, make him let down his guard so they could catch him. He ignored it, didn't budge. Other times they took the opposite tack. Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. In the Gospel of John, they even say, aren't we right in saying you, have a Samarit- you are a Samaritan and have a demon? For a Jew, no worse insult could be imagined. He didn't budge, didn't move him at all. Or they would threaten sometimes. Jesus, get out of here. Herod wants to kill you. Go tell that fox that I cast out demons and perform healings today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my course. In other words, I don't budge from the mission the Father has me on. I don't move a muscle without him. And I don't turn to the right or to the left based on any human threats or any human praise. Authority and humility, rooted in the Father's affirmation of his identity. What did that have to do with his acts of power, his walking in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit? Because he knew who he was, because he lived his life in communion with the Father and rooted himself in the Father's affirmation of his identity, he could carry out his mission with absolute confidence because he knew it was his mission given by the Father. Now that's Jesus. How about us? We're not quite there yet, right? 
In fact, we are all born in this fallen world with an identity crisis. How many of you are familiar with the movie The Born Identity? A few of you. Well, at the beginning of that movie, The Born Identity, this guy wakes up adrift on the ocean, and he has amnesia. He doesn't know who he is or how he got there. It's terrifying, of course. He finds that he has a passport, and on the passport is the name Jason Bourne. But he knows that that's a false identity. He's, he's walking through life with a false identity, not knowing who he is or where he comes from or what his life is about. And the movie is all about his quest to discover his true identity. Jason Bourne is an image of people in this fallen and broken world that we live in. How many people are adrift, wounded, confused about their identity, wearing a false identity, wearing a mask, hiding themselves from other people and even from themselves because they have no idea who they are. And so people in this fallen world are the opposite of Jesus. We lack authority and we lack humility. At one and the same time, we tend to be both prideful and timid. We tend to be arrogant and fearful because we're insecure in who we are. And so we have to, we have to shore up our identity. And so we, we base it on what we achieve and how other people view us, whether we're admired, or esteemed, popular, or beautiful, or athletic, or sexy, or wealthy, or smart, or probably more likely in our case, how holy we are. We base our identity on how holy we are. Even that has nothing to do with where our true identity lies. We think we have to earn God's love, like the older brother in the prodigal, parable of the prodigal son. And so we work hard to make ourselves better and more worthy in the eyes of God. And we constantly measure ourselves, compare ourselves to others. We get offended, sometimes even crushed, if someone does something that undermines our identity and, and the picture that we've built up of ourselves. Now, of course, that's the state of fallen humanity. But the good news that you, especially as priests and deacons, are called to proclaim to everyone in this world is that we have a born identity, one we're born with, one that cannot change, it cannot be taken with, taken from us because it's not something that we invented or can control or could construct in the first place, but something we were born with given by God from the first moment of our existence, in fact, even before we existed, born as his beloved children, destined to be with him forever if we believe in him and we accept his invitation to know him and love him. Of course, even more, in Christ, we have a reborn identity Christians are those with a reborn identity, baptized into Christ, and therefore adopted as a son or daughter of God, a king, a royal heir. Just as Satan tried to attack Jesus' identity, so he does for us. He will do everything in his power. And of course, as a fallen angel, he's very smart, and he knows for every one of us which buttons to push. And every morning when you wake up, He's scheming about how he can undermine your identity and how he can plunder you, rob you of the peace and the joy and the victory that belong to you by inheritance as a son of God. So he'll whisper things in your mind. You loser. You're never going to get better. You're always making that same mistake. You don't pray enough. You're not holy enough. You're not virtuous enough. You fail too often. You need to make up for your sins. You need to do a lot better. Who do you think you are to ask God for something so big? You're not worthy to be used by God. Whatever the script is that works for you, 
the evil one is trying to put into your mind all the time. And think about the things that knock you off your position of peace and joy and confidence in your sonship, in the mission the Lord has for you. For some, it might be any time you hear a cutting remark or put down. For some, it might be when, when your plans fall through. You had something all organized and set up and it just fell apart. Or it might be getting resistance or opposition or passive aggressive behavior from other people. Or maybe when somebody points out your faults and failings. Or maybe you've been praying hard for something and it wasn't answered the way you wanted it to be answered. And the evil one begins sowing those lies and we so easily listen to them rather than standing firm in our position the way Jesus did. It's precisely because of that, because we were insecure in our identity, we base our identity on human standards, that we lack expectant faith for the Lord to move through us in powerful ways. In fact, Jesus said this to the religious leaders. They were the ones who were, who were meant to be setting the pace for the rest of God's people. Jesus said to them in John 5, verse 44, how can you believe when you accept praise from one another and do not seek the praise that comes from the only God? Receiving praise from others, letting that be your, I mean, of course, there's nothing wrong with receiving praise in itself, but, but making that your foundation and your security, that actually keeps you from believing. How can you believe when you seek praise from others? And so, in order for us to be deeply rooted in that identity that God has given us, that reborn identity as sons and daughters of the King, we need the revelation that can only come from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. What truth? Well, I think St. Francis of Assisi summed it up so well. He prayed to know two things. Who are you, Lord? And who am I? Those are the truths the Holy Spirit wants to bring us into at a very deep level. Who he is and who I am in him. We can spend our whole life just learning those two truths. Who are you, Lord? The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals to us the passionate, crazy love of God the Father, the all-consuming fire of his love, his unimaginable compassion for every human person, his lordship over the whole universe, the victory of Jesus, his majesty reigning over all, that nothing happens outside of his lordship and his permission. The Holy Spirit shows us who he is. And who am I, Lord? I'd say there's an A and a B to what the Lord shows us about ourselves. First, he shows us we're poor. I'm poor. There's something deep in it, each of us that resists being poor. I don't want to be poor. I want to have something great to show God. I don't want to be needy. The Holy Spirit shows us. And if you've ever prayed for humility, you might have discovered it's one of the quickest prayers God ever answers. <laughs> And he shows you your poverty. You know, we, we can pray, oh, Lord, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm incapable of anything without you. I can do nothing apart from you. And then all of a sudden we fall flat on our face and we know it at a whole new level, right? Only the Holy Spirit can do that. St. Paul said, when he asked the Lord to remove a thorn in the flesh, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, I will all the more gladly boast of my weakness. I'm not going to be ashamed of it anymore. I'm not going to be discouraged by it. I'm not going to be weighed down by my weakness. I'm just going to rejoice in my weakness. Hallelujah. I'm pathetic. I'm desperate. <laughs> Hallelujah. That means, Lord, you can show your power all the more in me. St. Therese of Lisieux 
She said that when she arrived in heaven, she'd have nothing to show the Lord but empty hands. And she wasn't troubled by that one bit because he was the one who's going to fill her hands. She wasn't troubled by her littleness, her, her lack of some of the glorious virtues that some of the greater saints, Carmelites had. She just wanted to be empty before the Lord and let him fill her. St. John the Baptist said, I must decrease, but he must increase. What a beautiful thing to decrease day by day by day that the Lord would increase in us. And the more I know my poverty and I embrace my poverty and I, I recognize my weakness and I'm not ashamed of it and I'm not discouraged by it, the more I lean on the Lord the more radically I depend on him and the more freely he's able to act. A little story that illustrates that is told by my, my good friend, Dr. Bob Schutz. Any of you know Dr. Bob Schutz? Oh, he's a wonderful guy. He's a therapist in Florida and he also does a lot of prayer for healing and a lot of prayer for baptism in the Holy Spirit. And he tells about how one time he was asked to give a, a week at the Theology of the Body Institute, a week of teachings on sexual healing. And it was going to be for people who had experienced sexual trauma. And so he prepared for this for months. He had a friend, Father Mark, who was going with him. They both prayed for it. And all the time leading up to it, Bob prayed for poverty, spiritual poverty. And so they, they got to the beginning of, of this, this week-long uh, seminar and went through the first day, and he was teaching, and all his wonderful material about healing from sexual trauma. Second day, went through his teaching, and by the end of the second day, he, or it might have been the third day, he, he realized the people were getting a bit overwhelmed, and they were restless, and they just couldn't, they couldn't really take it in anymore. Uh, they, he, he just wasn't getting through to them anymore. And so he, he let them go early for the day, and he came to his friend, Father Mark, and he said, they're not even listening to me anymore. This is terrible. I don't know what I'm going to do. Father Mark said, hooray, this is what you've been praying for. <laughs> Spiritual poverty. And um, right then and there, he went to confession to Father Mark, and he just, just confessed his self-reliance, and he, he reaffirmed his absolute reliance on the Lord. Okay, Lord, you, you do this. I can't do it. And the next day, he went to begin the class again. And as he was beginning, he felt the Holy Spirit say, stop, don't do what you were planning to do. I want you to just read out Isaiah 61. Now, I think it was because of his prayer for that poverty that Bob was able to hear and obey that word rather than just launching into his prepared lesson. He was able to hear, no, don't rely on what, what you have planned, what you know how to do. Rely on me. And so he began to proclaim Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted. And as he proclaimed that word, he said, I can... I can hardly begin to describe to you what happened next, except to say that the students later dubbed it Pentecost Thursday. The Holy Spirit began to fall on that group. And after Bob finished proclaiming that passage, people began to weep. And they began to wail, like really deep grief coming up from within. And this went on for a while. People were releasing their grief. And then as suddenly as it had begun, it stopped and there was a deep, profound silence. And then after a few minutes of that, all of a sudden somebody started a, a song or something and there was just this burst of praise. <laughs> this, this burst of thanksgiving to God. And people were healed and touched at a deep level, way beyond anything Bob could have done in his teaching. Because he had embraced his poverty. So the Holy Spirit reveals our poverty 
But at the very same time, he reveals our incredible dignity, our incredible authority in Christ. Picture this image as a kind of example. You're up on a high mountain overlooking a splendid vista. And you see in the distance fields and hills and rivers and villages. And standing next to you is an attorney. And he puts his, hand around, his arm around you and he says, you see that rolling, those rolling hills in the distance and the mountains, the village over there? Yeah. He says, that's yours. You've inherited it. You say, Wow. And then he says, you see over there, that river like a, a silver thread running through the forests and, and the fields behind that? And, yeah. It's yours. You've inherited it. You know who that attorney is? <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. He's the one who reveals to us the kingdom that we've inherited it from God our Father by our baptism into Christ. Without that revelation from the Holy Spirit, our inheritance remains nothing but a document locked away in a filing cabinet in the attorney's office. But when the Holy Spirit reveals that inheritance to us, we respond in faith. Faith is a response to revelation. And when we respond in faith, then we go out and explore that territory. And we begin to enjoy that inheritance. Because it's not meant to be only a document locked away in a filing cabinet, even in this life. We're meant to actually take possession of that kingdom for the king of kings. And that kingdom is this whole world that he wants to win back to himself. So the Holy Spirit gives us that revelation of our inheritance and we respond in faith by acting on it. And we believe his revelation about our deepest identity as a son or daughter of God. Padre Pio said this. I've, I found this in a passage from the letters of Saint Pio, of Pietro Cina. And this is, this is back before anybody was talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or the charismatic renewal. He said, any mental picture of your life that focuses on past sins is a lie. And this comes from the devil. Jesus loves you and has forgiven your sins. So there is no room for having a downcast spirit. Whatever persuades you otherwise is truly a waste of time. It is also something that offends the heart of our very tender lover. On the other hand, if the mental picture of your life consists in what you can be or could be, then it comes from God. In other words, the Lord wants us to dream with him to allow him to fill our hearts with vision that comes from him about what his plan is for us. Whether you're younger or older, the Lord wants us to open our eyes to the greater things that he has for us, the immense inheritance that he has for us and the role that he has for each one of us in regaining this world for his beloved son. Once we discover that, once we realize the magnitude of our inheritance and our dignity in Christ, we can't be overcome anymore by lesser things. Once we get that revelation from the Holy Spirit, we can't be dominated anymore by other spirits. Now, they're going to rise up in us, but they won't be able to dominate us anymore. The spirit of lust a spirit of discouragement, a spirit of guilt, a spirit of judgment, a spirit of depression. They won't be able to rule over us anymore because when we know who we are in Christ, we will have confidence to fight that battle because we know who has won the battle. And 
priests and deacons who know their identity in Christ and the authority they have in Christ are not intimidated by the tactics of the enemy. Because they know God is their father, they know the Lord Jesus is victorious, who's with them always. They know that in this battle we're engaged in, that they're clothed in the armor of God and nothing can ultimately hurt them. They've read the book to the last page and they know who wins. And Satan is terrified of priests and deacons like that and of Christians like that. Because when the church is filled with disciples like that who walk in the peace and the joy of their identity in Christ, walking in the authority of Christ and the humility of Christ, free from the bondages of the enemy, then the dominion of darkness is in big trouble. I also have learned a lesson from the centurion in the gospel who came to Jesus with a request for his beloved servant who was lying at home deathly ill. And he asked Jesus to come and heal him, but then he said, but I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, my servant, do this, he does that. It's actually the only time in the Gospels that Jesus actually marvels at something that somebody says to him. Just imagine Jesus himself was struck. Wow, I've never seen faith like that. This guy gets it. He gets it. He's a man under authority. He's carrying out the commands of the Roman Empire. He's not doing his own thing. He's not building his own empire. He's carrying out the commands of his superior officers. And because of that, he has a rightful authority over his servants, and they obey him. Jesus is saying, he gets me. I live under the Father's authority. I do only as the Father has commanded me because I love the Father and I know his love for me. And because of that, I walk in absolute confidence in the power of the Holy Spirit that when I command sickness and even death, they obey me. He gets it. Another example. Think of two elementary school teachers. Some of you may have elementary schools in your parish, so you may know what this is like. Some teachers are insecure in their identity as teacher and their authority. And so they walk into a classroom where the kids are acting up and being boisterous and talking out of turn, and, and they say, okay now, children, quiet down. And the kids ignore them, right? And the teacher starts to threaten. Maybe she starts to yell. If you don't quiet down right now, you're not going to have any recess today. I'm going to give you extra homework. I'm going to send you to the principal. But the more she threatens, the more they ignore her because they know she doesn't really mean it. She doesn't really stand behind what she says. But then think of another one, another teacher. I know one like this. She's, a, she's now a high school principal. She can walk into an auditorium of 500 teenagers, and before she's said a word, they've settled down. They just know she means business. She doesn't have to threaten. She loves them. They know she loves them. She just walks in her authority as principal and previously as teacher. And therefore, they obey her. That's how the Lord wants us to be walking in the face of sickness, in the face of obstacles to the mission of the church and to our mission. That's the way he wants us to be walking in the face of the hindrances that the enemy will throw in our path. Confident in the authority that we have in Christ, but walking in utter humility because we know it isn't us. It's not about us at all. It's about him. You may have heard that today, one of the reasons we're living in an extraordinary time is that in many parts of the world, Raisings of the dead are not unusual anymore. And do you know where the greatest number, as, as far as we know from various reports, the greatest number of the raisings of the dead is taking place right now? It's in one of the poorest countries of the world, Mozambique, in the ministry of Heidi and Roland Baker. And it's not 
so much Heidi and Roland who are praying for the dead and seeing the dead raised. It's the people that they have evangelized way in these remote jungle villages who have nothing and think nothing of themselves, who, who just live in little huts with dirt floors. And they, they don't have a ministry. They hardly get paid. They, they don't know a whole lot, but they've been evangelized and they've been trained a little bit and they're on fire for God. And when a child dies or, or when somebody dies in the village, often they will take that, that child or that person and just pray with all their hearts, sometimes even for one, two, three days, fasting and praying. And sometimes that person will rise from the dead. They're totally empty of themselves, totally free from self-reliance, self-puffing up, and therefore they have room to be absolutely filled with the power of God manifest through them. And so my prayer for you this week is that as Father Dave said, the Holy Spirit would surprise you, that you would put off any limits that you've placed on God, any ways that, you, that you've put the Lord in a box and said, well, he, he does this through me, but he doesn't do this through me. Or maybe he used to do this, I, I used to have that gift, but not anymore, it's, it's done. I pray that you would just put off those limits and let the Holy Spirit give you new revelation. And I want to just pray as, as the disciples prayed in Acts chapter 4, as the church was starting to undergo persecution, oh Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants, these priests, deacons, and seminarians, Lord, grant them to speak your word with all boldness, with a new boldness, while you, Lord, stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are done in the name of your holy servant, Jesus for the building up of the church and for the evangelization of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.